This is lesson number two of our study of the Godhead. In our first lesson, we looked at the fact that in the Bible, the word Godhead is used. It's a reference to the divine nature or deity. We find that word in the King James Version in Acts 17, 29, in Romans 1, 20, and again in Colossians 2 and verse number 9. Now, in our first lesson, we talked about the existence of God. Some, some reasons that are evidences that, that God exists. Now tonight in our study, we're going to continue our study of the Godhead. We're going to talk about some of the attributes of God. Well, what's God like? The way our Bibles are divided, in the first chapter of the book of Genesis, there are 31 verses. And in those 31 verses, the word God is used about 30 times. And, and the expression God said is used about 10 times. Now what that does is it lets a student of the Bible know right out of the gates that, that God is the center of the Bible's message. And in that first chapter we learn the origin of, of the universe, we learn the origin of mankind, we learn the origin of life. But, but this God who created us he must be a powerful being to be able to create the universe out of nothing. But what's he like? You know, if we look at the sun, moon, and stars, and we look at the beauty of creation, we can appreciate God's power. But, but in terms of what's God really like, the only way for us to know what God is like is for God to tell us. And then that means then that we must turn to the Scriptures to see how God has revealed Himself to mankind. Now, people often have false ideas about what God is like. Now, sometimes they have false ideas because they simply don't know what the Bible says. And when they don't know what the Bible says, they get their concepts about God from some other source. They either hear them from someone else or they on their own come up with their own ideas. A second reason why people have false ideas about God is they actually know what the Bible says, but they don't want to receive what the Bible says about some aspect of God's nature. And so they prefer to have their own concepts. As we think about the traits or the attributes of God, some of those attributes or characteristics of God are things that can be said only about Him. In other words, human beings could not possibly possess those same characteristics. For example, God is all-knowing. Human beings have limitations on our knowledge, and so our level of knowledge could never reach God's level of knowledge. Same with God being all-powerful. Our, our power or might could never reach God's level. So some aspects of God's nature, they're out of our reach. But there are other things when it comes to God that, that God says to humans, I'm like this and I want you to be like this also. For example, God's holiness. God said, I'm holy and I want you to be holy. God says about himself, I am love and I want you to be loving. And so as we study the attributes of God, we need to see that distinction. Some of those attributes belong only to God, whereas some of those things that are said about God, to a lesser degree, human beings can imitate those characteristics that God possesses. As we study the, the attributes of God, it's important for us to understand that God is an infinite being. And when we say that, we simply mean that, that God has no limitations in any aspect of His existence. There are no limitations on God's qualities. Because if there were limitations, then He wouldn't be God. So, so in this lesson number two, we want to look at seven attributes of God. And then, Lord willing, we'll follow it up in our next lesson, in lesson number three, 
with six more attributes of God. And so when we're done with this section, studying the attributes of God, when we finished our work, we will have looked at 13 different attributes of God. Now, for some of those attributes, we will, we'll give more time to some than we will to others. Not because one is more important than another, but, but simply for, for practical purposes. So we begin to, in this first study of God's attributes by noticing the eternal nature of God. When we say that God is eternal, that simply means that He always has been, he is now and He always will be. Reminds us of the song, Holy, 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 who wast, who art, and evermore shall be. Actually, that thought comes from Revelation 4 and verse number 8. Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. So to say that God is eternal means that God had no beginning point and, and God will have no end. When, when God spoke to Moses, charging Moses to go back to Egypt so he could lead the Israelites out of slavery, Moses said, well, will I go and, and speak to my people? And they asked, who's the God that sent you? What am I going to say? And God said, you tell them that the I am sent you. I am would be the self-existent, eternally existent being. Now, God's eternal nature is seen in, in both covenants. We see it in, in the Old Testament. We see it in the New. We already mentioned Revelation 4 and verse number 8. Psalm 90 and verse 2 speaks about God in, the, in this language, from everlasting to everlasting thou art God. Sometimes people ask the question, and we understand the logic behind it, whether it comes from a four-year-old child or an 84-year-old person. Well, if God created all things, who made God? Well, that's, 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 that's an interesting, it's a fair question. And, and the reality is, if I could draw a line on this whiteboard behind me, and on that, on that line, put an X. And say that, that red X, that represents the point when God began to exist. Now, if I could do that, that wouldn't be the true God. Because the true God has no limitations. I, I might wear a T-shirt that has the name of a university on it. They say that university was established in 1841 or 1927 or whatever the year. You can't do that with the God of heaven and say this is when God was established. This is when God began to exist. God never began to exist. Anything that began to exist cannot be the infinite, limitless God. And so one of God's attributes or characteristics is His eternal nature. A second aspect of, of God's nature is His uniqueness. There's only one true God. He said about Himself, I am the first and the last, and beside me there is no God. Isaiah 44 and verse number 6. Now in the ancient city of Ephesus, there were many idols. There, there was this magnificent structure that was built to Diana. And people from that part of the world went there to, to worship and to take home little idols. But when Paul wrote a letter to Christians who lived in that city, he said there is one God, Ephesians 4 and verse number 6. And that one God must be self-existent and independent. He does not rely on anyone else to make him complete. If the God of heaven needed God number two to make him complete, then the God of heaven wouldn't be 
a complete God. He couldn't be the real God. The real God, the true God, must be self-existent. He must be independent. He must be self-reliant. And He must have no limitations in any of His attributes. If you have the materials that I shared with you there in front of you, if you look over on page number 2, you'll see a chart that I've prepared from Jeremiah chapter 10. And it really covers Jeremiah 10 verses 1 through 16, which shows us a very clear contrast between idols and the true God of heaven. Now, that's not the only passage. It's not the only passage that, that shows a clear contrast between idols and God. But when you look at that chart, you know, the first one, there, idols are made by men's hands. God made the men and the hands that they possess. Idols cannot speak, but God does. Idols cannot do anything, but in the context, God brings the rain and the wind and, and all of those things. So look over that chart, and you'll see some clear distinctions, things into which we can sink our teeth that show here is a, 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 a clear contrast between the gods that humans serve that they make with their own hands and the God of heaven. So a second attribute of, of the God of heaven is his uniqueness. There is none like him. The, the third aspect of, of God that we want to consider in this lesson is God's holiness. Okay? And I'm just going to read here from Vine's definition of the word holy. He says from the Greek word hagios, H-A-G-I-O-S, is how we spell it in English. And he said the word hagios fundamentally signifies separated. And he said among the ancient Greeks, they used that word when they were dedicating something to their gods. And he says hence in scripture, this word hagios or holy, in its moral and spiritual significance, means separated from sin and therefore consecrated to God or sacred. And as one other human author observed, the idea of God being holy is God being separated from that which he created. And when it comes to moral evil, there is complete separation between God and all forms of moral evil. Well, how much evil has God ever committed? What's God ever done that was wrong? And the answer is nothing. The Bible says in Psalm 92 and verse number 15, there is no unrighteousness in Him. There is no unrighteousness in God. Well, what would the conclusion be? Well, first of all, remember this. The Bible says in 1 John 5 and verse 17, all unrighteousness is sin. If all unrighteousness is sin and there's no unrighteousness in God, then that means that there's no sin in God. Everything that God says, everything that God thinks, everything that God does is proper. Okay? And so this idea of holiness is God's separation from all types of moral evil. Now, when the children of Israel were at Mount Sinai, God, God said to Israel, I, I want you to be holy. In, in Leviticus chapter 11, and verse number 44, the Bible says, For I am the Lord your God, ye shall therefore sanctify yourselves, and ye shall be holy, for I am holy. Neither shall ye defile yourselves with any manner of creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. And again there in verse 45, ye shall therefore be holy, for I am holy. And we go on to read there in verse 47 that they were to make a distinction between the clean and between the unclean. And so here's one of God's characteristics that he wants humans to possess as well. That as he is holy, he wants us to be holy. We already made reference to Revelation chapter 4 and verse number 8. 
But again, the, the heavenly beings bow down before the, the throne of God and say, holy, 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 to emphasize the degree of his holiness. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. I shared with you there as, as point number eight in this section, a, a quotation from Brother Wendell Winkler as Brother Winkler pointed out that not only is God holy, but those things that are affiliated with God are also described as being holy. And, and, and as you see there in that paragraph, he speaks about the holy place and the most holy place within the tabernacle. He, he speaks about the holy Sabbath, the holy feast days, the holy angels, the holy scriptures, the holy apostles and prophets, the holy city of Jerusalem, the holy new Jerusalem, and so on. And you know, with those things in mind, whatever God has designated as being holy, whatever he's designated as being sanctified for his purpose, then humans need to respect that. Humans need to show reverence for that which God designates as being holy. Well, here's a fourth attribute of God that we want to consider, and this is one that, you know, we even teach the small children, and that is God's omnipotence. That's just a fancy way of saying that God is all-powerful. Omni, all, potence, potent, potent is power, all powerful. As we sometimes sing with the children, my God is so big, so strong and so mighty, there's nothing my God cannot do. A number of times in the scriptures, we read that God is almighty. We read that in, in Genesis chapter 17 and in verse number 1 where, where God calls Abraham to walk before him the almighty God. That word almighty is used about 10 times in the New Testament. And I find it interesting. In the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 6, you find the word almighty. In the New Testament, every other time you read the word Almighty, it's used in the book of Revelation. Now, I find that interesting because in the book of Revelation, we're reading about the adversaries of God's people. And we're reading about the, the struggles which God's people face. And, and you see these, these battles between the Lamb and, and His opponents or His enemies. And, and, and the message of the book of Revelation is, as the Christ was victorious, so God's faithful people will be victorious over all earthly foes. And in that context of that message about being victorious, over and over the message is given the one who sits on the throne and the one whom Christians serve, he's almighty. And so that word almighty indicates that, that God is omnipotent. In the King James Version and the New King James Version, the word omnipotent is used one time in Revelation 19.6. For the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. Pretty well known psalm written based on that. Instead of the word omnipotent there in Revelation 19 and verse 6, some versions have the word almighty. But, but more than once in the scriptures, we, we find the, the, the message expressed that there's nothing too hard for the Lord. As Jesus was speaking to his apostles, speaking about salvation, speaking about rich people and how difficult it is for those who trust in riches to enter into the kingdom. The apostles want to know, well, Lord, 
If that's the case, who then can be saved? And Jesus' response was, with God, all things are possible. That's the same thing that, that Gabriel told Mary when he was speaking to her about her coming conception of the Son of God. Well, God has manifested His power in a number of ways. God's manifested His power in, in the creation of the world simply by speaking. When God said, let there be light, and, and there was light. God has manifested His power in, in performing other miracles. We think about the children of Israel crossing the Red Sea on dry land. We think about God providing manna and God doing all of those things in the wilderness for the children of Israel. There's another aspect of God's power, and that is that, that the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. Romans chapter 1 and, and verse number 16. And now someone might wonder, if all things are possible with God, then why does the Bible say that it's impossible for God to do something? Well, what is it the Bible says that it's impossible for God to do? It's impossible for God to lie. So, so the question is, if God can do everything, then why does the Bible say that there's something that's not possible for God to do? Well, we read in, in Hebrews 6 and verse 18 that it's not possible for God to lie. Or the same language or similar language in Titus 1 and verse 2, God who cannot lie. What does it mean it's impossible for God to lie? Lying would be against God's nature, okay? God, God cannot deny himself, and God cannot act in any way which is not in harmony with his nature, okay? That's why it's impossible for God to lie. Now, sometimes people bring up absurdities. Say, well... You know, there, there's a definition for a square. What it means for an object to be a square. Well, could God make a round square? Could God make a square circle? Well, those are absurdities and go against the very definitions of those terms. God, God's not involved in absurdities. And, you know, remember that as we speak about the attributes of God, it may be the case that in the Scriptures we have more information about one aspect of God's being than we do about another aspect. Or, or there may be some aspect of God's nature that's mentioned more often. Maybe not additional information, but it's repeated more often. That does not take away from the other attributes that God possesses. We cannot take one attribute of God and set it in opposition of another one and say, well, this attribute cancels out this one. Or this attribute removes this other characteristic of God. You know, we, there, there's the goodness of God, there's the severity of God, Romans eleven twenty two, 22. And God willing, we'll look at, at, at some aspects of those thoughts in our next lesson. Okay? So to say that God is all-powerful. It simply means that God is capable of doing anything that does not involve inconsistency or absurdity. Okay? Now remember, there's a difference in what God can do, God's power to act, and God's will or desire to do something. It's very important when we study the Scriptures, again, that we recognize the difference between God's power and what God desires, that is, God's will. God has never promised us. He, he's never said to mankind, in every single instance, I'm going to use all of the power that I possess. Let, let me give you an example. There were times when Jesus lived on the earth when he miraculously multiplied food. He took a small amount of food and fed about 5,000 men plus women and children. 
He did the same thing with 4,000 men. That, that was a miracle. He, 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 he employed his power to multiply that food, to, to provide a meal for that great multitude of people. But he didn't always do that. There were occasions where Jesus was a guest in someone's home and someone else prepared a meal. Jesus had the power to say, let me do the cooking. Let me prepare the meal. You don't need to mess with cooking, but he didn't do it. And so keep that in mind. Just because God is all-powerful, we should not assume that that means in every instance, God is going to employ every aspect of his power. That's not how God operates. Well, let's look at a fifth aspect of God's nature, and that is God's immutability. That is God's unchanging nature. Let me turn over and read from Psalm 102. And if this passage sounds familiar, it may be because it's quoted near the end of Hebrews chapter 1. But in Psalm 102, beginning in verse 24, I said, O my God, take me not away in the midst of my days. Thy years, speaking to God, thy years are throughout all generations. Of old hast thou laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the work of thy hands. They, that is the heavens, shall perish, but thou shalt endure. Yea, all of them shall wax old like a garment. As a vesture shalt thou change them, and they shall be changed. But thou art the same, and thy years shall have no end. That's Psalm 102 verses 24 to 27. The, the, the earth, the heavens, the material things that God created, okay, those shall perish, but Jehovah God will endure forever and ever. The material things in some aspect, the psalmist said, shall be changed, but God He's, he's, he's the same. In contrast to material things, God stays the same. That is God's immutability. In the last book of the Old Testament, in Malachi chapter 3 and verse number 6, here's what God said about himself. For I am the Lord, I change not. Now that's encouraging, okay? It's encouraging to know that as Christians, we serve the same God that's described in the Old Testament. It's not a new God. In Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 1, the Bible says, God, who at sundry times, that is in various ways, God who at sundry times and in divers manners, spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son. Well, the God who spoke in ancient times by the prophets is still speaking today through the new covenant message of his son. And so the God whom Abraham served and Daniel served, that's the same God whom we serve. And so the God of heaven does not change. And it's, it's encouraging to us to know that we do not serve a wishy was she God? We serve a consistent, never changing God. Now, now, because God is never changing, when you think about God's power, that would mean that God's power cannot increase, nor can God's power decrease. If it were true, that God is more powerful today than he was yesterday, then that means yesterday he was not all powerful, and if he was not all powerful, that wasn't the true God. Same with God's love. We couldn't do anything to make God love us more 
or to make God's love for us decrease. If God's love could increase, then that means before that, he was not all loving. And if God's love can go down, once his love would go down, then he wouldn't be a complete God. So, so God, in every aspect of his being, is unchanging in terms of his power, in terms of his love, in terms of his knowledge, or whatever it might be. You say, well, hasn't God's law changed? Oh, God's, God's revelation to mankind, God's message about which covenant is in force, yeah, there's been a change in that. In Hebrews chapter 7, the writer of the book of Hebrews shows that with Jesus as our high priest, well, that's a different priesthood. Under the Old Testament instruction, Jesus could not have been priest because he was from the tribe of Judah. Under the old law, priest had to be from the tribe of Levi and had to be a male descendant of Aaron. Jesus was not from the tribe of Levi, so he couldn't have been a descendant of Aaron. But he's our priest. So the message of Hebrews 7 is, where there's a changing of the priesthood, there also must be a necessity, a change of the law. Again, Hebrews 7 and verse number 12. Now, now when the Bible speaks about the changing of the law, that doesn't mean that God changed the message of the old law, but it means rather that a new law is in force. Now, God's power doesn't change, but God's plans can change. God's practices can change, or in modern language, God's mode of operation can change. Think about how God created Adam and Eve. For Adam, he took the dust of the earth. For Eve, he took a rib out of Adam's sack. Question, does God still have the power today to make males out of the dust of the earth and make females from the rib of males? The answer is yes. God's power hasn't changed one bit. But his plan has. God no longer is using that power to make humans. Instead, he placed within humans reproductive system so that they could come together as male and female and, and, and reproduce humans. Here's another example from the Old Testament. When the children of Israel were in the wilderness, God provided them with food from heaven, manna. And they ate that manna for 40 years. And then they got into the land of Canaan, and the next day, in the, in, once they got in the land of Canaan, on the next day, the manna stopped. Has God had a, a, a shortage of power? Has God had a power outage? No. God's power is the same as it always was. God's plan now is different. God no longer miraculously provides food for mankind. Uh, so, so, so make sure that you, you see that distinction between God's power and God's will or God's power and God's plan. You know, as, as we speak about miraculous activity, sometimes people will quote or, or refer to Hebrews 13, verse number 8, that Jesus Christ the same yesterday and forever said, well, if he was doing miracles back then, then he's still doing them now. Well, no. He's had the power to do them back then. He has the power to do them now, but his plan has changed. But that does not take away from God's power. But there's the immutability of God. There's also, number six, the omniscience of God. Again, that's just a fancy way of saying that God knows all things. You say, well, where'd God get all that knowledge? Well, not the same way you and I get knowledge. God did not gain knowledge through personal experience. God did not gain knowledge by sitting back and watching what other people do by observation. God did not get knowledge by what we call book learning. God did not get knowledge by somebody instructing him, giving him hands-on guidance. God didn't get his knowledge from anyone. 
He just possesses it. The Bible says in Psalm 145 and I'm sorry, 147 and verse 5 that, that God's understanding is infinite. There, there's nothing that God does not know. 1 John 3 and verse 20. God knows all things. Even the what? Even the secret things. You know, with humans, sometimes we're, we're talking, saying, well, listen, I got this surprise party plan. Not, not help me keep a secret. And so among humans, sometimes we have secrets. Well, we have things that we try to not, not let the cat out of the bag. And we try to keep them undercover, so to speak. But, but there are no secrets with the God of heaven. As the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 13, all things are naked and open unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Okay, so, so God sees in darkness as well as you and I see in broad daylight. God sees the future as clearly as you and I see the present. God knows everything about the past. He knows everything that's going on now in the present. And He knows everything about the future. And you know, there's some fascinating things that the Bible mentions. He, you know, about God knowing the number of our hairs. God knowing the number of the stars and the names of the stars. God knows that stars have names. <laughs> He knows all of those names and He knows the number of the stars. Psalm 147 and verse number 4. Now, just as we talked about, it's important to see a distinction between God's power and God's will. It's also important we see a distinction between God's knowledge and God's will. It's one thing to say that God sees in advance that something will happen. It's one thing to say that. It's another thing entirely to say that God wants something to happen. On a daily basis, murders take place. Yesterday, God knew the murders which would be which would be carried out today. He knew the murders that would take place today. Does that mean that God wanted those murders to happen? No. Every day there is abuse in the home. God knows in advance there's going to be abuse. Does God want that abuse to take place? And the answer is no. So don't confuse what God knows with what God Wants. Now, now, as humans, we, we don't have knowledge on the same level that God does. But if you were, were able to see from above or even on the same level that two speeding trains are coming at one another on the same track, there's no option of getting off to another track. They're coming at one another in opposite directions on the same track at a high rate of speed and they are 50 yards apart at that time and, and they're, they're going to crash. And you see that. It doesn't mean you want it to happen, but you see it in advance. God knew that Judas Iscariot was going to betray Jesus. That doesn't mean that Judas' carrot gets a pat on the back for what he did. So there's a distinction between God's knowledge and, and God's, God's will or God's desire. Now here's the last one I want to consider tonight. Number seven, and that is the omnipresence of God. Again, omni is all presence is, well, you know what that means. Uh, all presence. To say that God is omnipresent means He's present everywhere at once. As Brother uh, Thomas Warren pointed out, God is not limited as to place. He is everywhere. God is simply not contained within bounds of either time or space. In Psalm 139, the psalmist did not use the word omnipresent 
But he basically said, wherever I go, you, you, you seem to be there. Psalm 139 and verse 7 beginning. Whither shall I go from thy spirit? Or whither shall I flee from thy presence? If I ascend up into heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, or Sheol, behold, thou art there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there shall thy hand lead me, and thy right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, even the night shall be light about me. Yea, the darkness hideth not from thee, but the night shineth as the day. And the darkness and the light are both alike to thee. For thou hast possessed my reins, and thou hast covered me in my mother's womb. So, so there's this concept of, of God being all present. In the book of Jeremiah, in chapter 23, we read a couple of questions that God asked about himself. And they're rhetorical questions. That is, they don't need an answer because the answer is obvious. Jeremiah 23 and verse 23. Am I a God at hand, saith the Lord, and not a God afar off? Am I God only at close range? What about at long distance? Can any hide himself in secret places that I shall not see him, saith the Lord? Do not I fill heaven and earth, saith the Lord. And so the obvious indication is, God is omnipresent. There's no place to go to get away from God. As Paul was speaking to the Athenians at Mars Hill, and we read that in Acts 17, he's speaking about God's nature as the Lord of heaven and earth, and he gives unto all men life and breath and all things. Uh, Acts 17, verse 25, he said, He is not far from every one of us, Acts 17 and verse number 29. So, what does that mean to Christians? What's our takeaway from the reality that God is omnipresent? Well, it's comforting. It's comforting in this sense. It's comforting to know that regardless of where we are in the world, we can serve the God of heaven. Regardless of where we are in the world, we can come before His throne in worship and come before His throne in prayer. So it's comforting in that sense. It's also encouraging to know that regardless of where a person is in the world, the Lord's hand is able to save that person from sin. God's salvation is available everywhere in the world. And it's comforting to know that God can be our strength and our help anywhere we are in the world and also to know that God sees the trials that we face regardless of where we are. So on the one hand, knowing that God is all present and all knowing, it's comforting and it's encouraging. At the same time, to know that God is everywhere and sees everything, that also is a sobering thought that hopefully will cause us to make good choices. Because there's nowhere you and I can go to hide from the presence of God. Whatever we're thinking, whatever we're saying, whatever we're doing, God knows. He knows everything about everything that we're doing. And so, so it's humbling, it's sobering, but at the same time, it's encouraging. Now, let's take a quick look at, at the questions on, on lesson two, and it's just a review of what we've had in this lesson. It's, it's the, the idea, number one is, to say that God is an infinite being means what? He's not limited in any way. Unlimited in all of his attributes. Now the good thing about having this lesson 
on videos, you, you can stop it anytime you want and, and you know go back and, and listen again and pause it so you can write what you want to. Number two, to say that God is eternal means He always has been and always will be. He had no beginning and He will have no end. Number three, to say that God is unique means He is one of a kind. There is none like Him. Number four, to say that God is holy means what? He is separate from and above his creation and all moral evil. Separate from and above his creation and separate from, from all moral evil. Number five, to say that God is omnipotent means that he is all powerful, capable of doing anything that possibly can be done. Number six, to say that God is immutable means his nature does not change. Number seven, to say that God is omniscient means he is all-knowing. He knows everything from the past, the present, and the future. To say that God is omnipresent means he is not limited to or not limited by place, time, or space. So, so in this lesson, we've looked at seven of God's attributes. Lord willing, in our next lesson, lesson number three, we'll look at six more of God's attributes. And the fact that we put them into the next lesson does not mean that they are of less importance. The order in which we are studying these has no meaning. Every single aspect of, of God's nature is important. And the better we can understand God, the closer we can draw to Him. And in those attributes of His that we are capable of imitating, the better we'll be able to imitate those things. And also in, in terms of evangelizing, the better we understand God, the better we will be able to tell others about Him and strengthen the faith of our children and our young people. Until next time, God bless.